Good morning. Good morning and welcome to you all. Uh, you're all very warmly welcome to today's lecture on Afterlife Hope before the New Testament by a distinguished speaker, Father Jeremy Cawley. I'd like to express a particular word of thanks to each of you for attending online today on behalf of the Catholic Biblical Association of Great Britain, of which I'm chair. Today's lecture concludes our recent series of four talks celebrating the 80th anniversary of the Catholic Biblical Association of Great Britain. The CBAGB was originally founded in 1940 to promote interest by the Catholic laity of Great Britain in the Holy Scriptures and to foster Catholic biblical scholarship in this country. I'm also joined on screen this morning to welcome our speaker by Father Adrian Graffy, a fellow committee member of the CBA, who was also a member of the committee when today's speaker, Father Jeremy Corley, was himself the chair of the CBA GB in the early 2000s. Jeremy Corley is lecturer in sacred scripture and director of research at the Pontifical University, St. Patrick's College in Maynooth, Ireland. Uh, Jeremy has a particular research interest in the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, uh, Hebrew Bible, uh, and the Septuagint, particularly Sirach and Tobit, and more broadly in Second Temple Jewish literature. Dr. Corley has published a wealth of scholarly articles, studies, and books on these topics, but I'll just mention three titles that may particularly interest you for further reading. Jeremy's written a commentary on Sirach in the new Collegeville Bible Commentary series, published by the Liturgical Press in 2013. He's also, also recently co-edited a book with colleagues entitled Maynooth College Reflects on COVID-19, New Realities in Uncertain Times. And this was published by Messenger Publications in April 2021. In this timely book, Reflecting on Where is God in the COVID-19 Pandemic, Jeremy's chapter offered a scriptural and theological reflection on the pandemic through the lens of the Babylonian exile as a time of lamentation and loss, and yet also as a time of Sabbath reflection on the presence of God in our daily lives. And the chapter is entitled Exile and Sabbath, Scriptural Models for a Time of Pandemic. Uh, finally, we anticipate with excitement Jeremy's forthcoming publication of the commentary on Sirach for the new fully revised third edition of the Jerome Biblical Commentary. It's going to be called the Jerome Biblical Commentary for the 21st Century. Uh, it's going to be edited by John J. Collins and others and published by Bloomsbury later this year. So we're delighted that Jeremy has agreed to share his theological insights on the wisdom literature with us today, reflecting upon the fascinating topic of the emergence and development of hope in an afterlife in a range of scriptural texts spanning the Second Temple Jewish era. So I now welcome Jeremy Corley with thanks to begin today's lecture entitled Afterlife Hope Before the New Testament. So thank you very much, Jeremy. Thank you, Sean, for your kind introduction. So um, there's a PowerPoint which is going to be shown in a moment. Uh, so as you heard, the title is Afterlife Hope Before the New Testament. So um, this is a question that people ask. What did people believe in the times of the Old Testament um, about the afterlife? And it seems that um, in the very earliest times, um, the idea was that when you died, you went to some kind of shadowy existence in the underworld. But the later on, um, around the second century before Christ, um, and it seems perhaps as a response to the Maccabean crisis, that um, uh, after that, um, people began to think about how if, if somebody had died who had been faithful, God could recreate them to life, especially the martyrs who died as Maccabees. So um, the question then for our topic then is how did resurrection belief arise within Judaism in the two centuries before Christ? So, um, so some of the earlier texts we can see fairly clearly, Psalm 88 and Job chapter 3. These attest the ancient Jewish belief that the dead have a shadowy existence in the underworld. Two of the wisdom books, Ecclesiastes and Sirach, also have no belief in any meaningful personal afterlife. So for us as Christians, Easter is a very important feast for us, the celebration of the resurrection of Christ our Saviour. And for the beloved uh, people who've died, who've gone ahead of us and have died, uh, uh, those who've gone before us, we look forward to their resurrection and to seeing them again in the resurrection. But in the early times of the Old Testament, there wasn't any clear understanding of resurrection. 
the belief was just that when you died, you went into some kind of shadowy existence in the underworld, in Sheol. But reflection on the persecution of devout Jews by a guy called Antiochus Epiphanes, who was the um, Syrian Greek king uh, occupying the Holy Land in the second century, this led to a growing belief in individual resurrection, and especially for martyrs. So we'll be looking at that uh, as we go through. And such a resurrection belief is evident at the end of the book of Daniel, also in the second book of Maccabees, and in the book of Wisdom. This became the predominant view at the time of the New Testament. So Jesus talks about the resurrection in his discussions, for example, with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So the Catechism of the Catholic Church, just um, to uh, introduce the topic, um, talks very briefly about the Old Testament. And it talks about um, how in the Old Testament, God was gradually teaching people. The economy of the Old Testament was deliberately so oriented that it should prepare for and also declare in prophecy the coming of Christ, the Redeemer of all. And God didn't reveal everything in one go. God called Abraham, but Abraham wouldn't have had a clear understanding of the resurrection. Later on, uh, God called Moses, God gave Moses the Torah, the Ten Commandments and so on. Moses led the people out of slavery in Egypt. But again, there wasn't any clear understanding of the resurrection. Later on, David, the great king of Israel, Solomon, the wise teacher, and even the prophets, they wouldn't have had any very clear understanding of the resurrection. It was only at the very end of the Old Testament period, a couple of centuries before the coming of Christ, that the idea, the belief in the resurrection became strong among the Jewish people. So we'll be looking at that as, uh, in our presentation. So back to the catechism. Even though the Old Testament books contain matters which we would now regard as being imperfect and provisional, they were on the journey, the books of the Old Testament bear witness to the whole divine pedagogy of God's saving love. God teaching the people of his love, first of all, for the people of Israel, but ultimately his love for everybody in the world. Then we move on to another document called the Gift of Scripture. 2005. This was a teaching document of the Catholic bishops of England and Wales. And it says, a survey of Old Testament books shows how God's revelation gradually brings people to a deeper and richer understanding. The divine pedagogy, God teaching his people, has taken a group of people, the people of Israel, where it found them. So God didn't reveal everything in one go. God didn't hand the people of Israel, or indeed Jesus didn't hand the first disciples, the whole Summa Theologica of St. Thomas Aquinas. You know, there was a gradual progression in faith. So the divine pedagogy has taken a group of people where it found them and has led them patiently in the direction of an ideal union with God and also towards a moral integrity. So, um, for example, in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill, but even today, killings do go on. So God was leading them towards a moral integrity, which our modern society is still far from fully attaining. This journey of the divine pedagogy, God teaching us, this journey is slow and difficult because that's the nature of human learning and human growth. So God gradually revealed himself to the people of Israel and ultimately uh, with the coming of Christ, the fullness of revelation to the disciples. And even the first disciples of Christ didn't understand everything. And there's been theological reflection since the time of Christ. Uh, for example, the doctrine of the Trinity was articulated um, uh, sometime after, you know, within Christian history, and so on and so forth. So it's been a gradual process. And perhaps we could look particularly uh, to illustrate the point of about the afterlife of Paul on trial in Jerusalem. Paul on trial in Jerusalem. This is from Acts chapter 23. So Paul has done his three missionary journeys and now he's come back to Jerusalem and he's been arrested there. And so Paul on trial, this question of the resurrection arises there. So by the time of uh, Christ and the time of St. Paul, um, the view, the faith in the resurrection was accepted by most of the Jews, including the Pharisees, but it wasn't accepted by the Sadducees. The Sadducees kept to the old tradition, the older belief. So it says here, when Paul noticed that some were Sadducees in the council, and others were Pharisees, he called out in the council. He said, brothers, I'm a Pharisee, and I'm the son of Pharisees. And why am I being put on trial? I'm being put on trial concerning the hope of the resurrection of the dead. So the Pharisees believed in the resurrection, but the Sadducees didn't. 
this was a kind of a sore point or a point of difference. So what happened? When you said this, a dissension or a disagreement began between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say that there's no resurrection, no angel, no spirit. So they uh, re refer back to the early traditions of the Old Testament. But on the other hand, the Pharisees acknowledge all three. So the Pharisees believed in the resurrection, and most of the Jews by the time of, of the New Testament seem to have believed uh, in the resurrection. Okay, so um, now one of the key texts um, that's often understood in terms of the resurrection is from Job chapter 19. So Job is one of the wisdom books of the Old Testament, and today we'll look a lot at the various wisdom books. And then a question would arise, when can we date the book of Job? And the, the book of Job seems to have some very early traditions, um, but some people think it might have been put together somewhat late. So but I'm not going to go into that uh, at the moment. There's a passage in chapter 19 which is often understood as being as talking about the resurrection. For I know that my Redeemer lives and that he will stand and that the last he will stand upon the earth and after my skin has thus been destroyed yet in my flesh I shall see God. So um, this may be familiar to um, some people through um, Handel's Messiah, that great aria. I know that my etc 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 okay so um so in the king james version or the authorized version of the bible those three verses job 19 25 to 27 read as follows for i know that my redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth and though after my skin worms destroy this body yet in my flesh shall i see god whom i shall see for myself and mine eyes shall behold and not another. So the illustration shows that um, this could be used, for example, for an Easter greeting or an Easter card. I know that my Redeemer lives. And within the Christian context, the Redeemer is very often identified with Christ. And then looking ahead, perhaps to the future, you know, Christ's second coming, that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. So that's been a Christian interpretation. And if we go, for example, to St. Augustine, that great um, uh, patristic author, Latin patristic author from North Africa, his great book, The City of God, interprets this as a prophecy of Christ. So what's he say in book 22? As for the words of the above mentioned Job, as found in the Hebrew manuscripts, then the quotation in verse 26, and in my flesh I shall see God, no doubt they were a prophecy of the resurrection of the flesh. So this is understood as being uh, looking ahead to the resurrection. And there the large picture you can see, George Frederick Handel, Esquire. Um, and you can see this is actually the memorial that uh, exists for him in Westminster Abbey. And you can see um, there's the score of the Messiah. And again, that very same uh, quotation, I know that my Redeemer liveth, that great aria uh, from Handel's Messiah. But um, many scholars today um, would say that this is an anachronistic, that um, Job probably doesn't specifically refer to the afterlife. Now we can understand it in the light of the future development of faith to speak about the afterlife, but probably in its original context, um, it didn't uh, believe that. So if we look at the NRSV translation, not very different from the King James Version. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been thus destroyed, then in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see on my side, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. It's a picture of Job uh, sitting in the dust uh, with his grief and his pain, you know, suffering physically and feeling uh, distant from God, but still holding on to his faith in God as Redeemer, as Goel. So Job's hope to see God. Job's hope to see God. So this is my kind of paraphrase of Job's hope to see God. So I know that my Redeemer lives. Well, for Job, writing hundreds of years before the coming of Christ, he wouldn't have had any clear understanding of Christ. So his Redeemer would be God. And many of the Psalms call God Goel, Redeemer. I know that my Redeemer lives, namely God, and that at the last, in other words, when all these sufferings are over, then he will stand upon the earth. 
And we don't necessarily have to take that literally. It may just be a, a poetic uh, expression for that God would intervene. And after my skin has thus been destroyed, in other words, by these afflictions and sufferings, we remember that Job was afflicted with a terrible skin disease. Then in my flesh, in other words, when my flesh is restored, and in my flesh, namely on earth then, I shall see God, whom I shall see on my side. And I put a reference there to Job chapter 38, because at the end of the book of Job, God reveals himself to Job in the whirlwind, that great uh, storm. So whom are God, whom I shall see on my side, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. So after God has revealed himself to Job, Job 38, 39, 40, 41, in chapter 42, we have Job's final response. Job 42, verse 5. I'd heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. So within the context of the book, the God being seen by Job, Job seeing God, which he longed for, he longed for an encounter with God. He's already now seen God by the end of the book. So whereas in Christian interpretation, it's often been understood as looking ahead to the future, to the resurrection, um, probably in the original context, um, Job wanting to see God directly Job now does have this experience with, of God, this encounter with God. He sees God and his flesh is restored uh, when he's uh, uh, revived and uh, is able to, is blessed once again, as we read at the very end of the book of Job. So the next slide is just a picture of uh, somebody standing on a beach with a huge wave there, uh, high waves. And this is just, um, I, there's, I couldn't find any good representation of the theophany, God appearing himself as his, himself to Job um, in Job 38. So this is just to represent uh, Job overwhelmed by the almighty power of God, God who controls the whole cosmos, controls the whole world. So you have Job encountering God, Job seeing God, but it seems to me that in the book of Job there's no clear understanding of the afterlife, no clear hope of the resurrection. So um, if we look then at Job chapter 14, mortals do not rise again. Mortals do not rise again, Job chapter 14. So Job uses the image of a tree, and a tree, in a, perhaps in a rather dry climate, a tree that might have been cut down, but the, when the water suddenly comes, then a tree, even the stump of a tree, could spring up again and uh, uh, come back to life. But then Job says, but human beings aren't like that. Once we're dead, we're dead and gone. So what does the text say? Job 14, verse 7. For there is hope for a tree if it's cut down, that perhaps it may sprout again, and that its shoots will not cease. Even though its root has grown old in the earth, even though its stump has, seems to have died in the ground, yet at the scent of water, so this is in a dry climate, when water comes along, then the stump will bud, and it will put forth branches like a, like a young plant. So you might have cut down a tree, but the stump might produce new shoots once again. But then by contrast then, what about human beings? Job says, but mortals die and they're laid low. Human beings expire, and where are they? As waters fail from a lake, they're either, they evaporate, they dry out, or they, they run away. And as a river wastes away and dries up, so mortals lie down and do not rise again. Until the heavens are no more, they will not awake or be roused out of their sleep. So in other words, there's no clear faith in the afterlife or the resurrection. No clear hope of a personal afterlife. This seems to have been the view of the people of Israel um, uh, right up to the second century BC, up to the time of the Maccabees. Now, um, this presentation is trying to make sense of various texts across the Old Testament or across the Hebrew Bible. Um, and in any particular case, it might be possible to argue a difference of interpretation, but I'm trying to present the kind of general picture. And obviously I wasn't around in the ancient times of the people of Israel. All we have is these texts and we try to read them today in the 21st century. And so we don't know exactly, did all Jews believe this everywhere uh, across different uh, time zones and different places and so on. We just don't know, but on the basis of the text that we have. So moving on now to Job's first lament. So Job's first lament in chapter three. So the book of Job begins with Job uh, being afflicted, first of all, 
The poor man loses all of his 10 children, and then he himself is struck down with some kind of terrible skin disease. And that the, in the introduction, he seems to be a man of uh, faith and resignation. Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall return. The Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Then suddenly in chapter three, when the poetry begins, Job's first lament is a huge outburst, a complaint. Why was I ever born? So he says, why did I not die at birth? Why did I come forth from the womb? Why did I not come forth from the womb and just expire? Why wasn't I just buried like a stillborn child or like an infant that never sees the light? So I just wish I could die. And why? He doesn't say, I wish I could die and then see God in the resurrection. Uh, all he has is this idea of resting in the underworld. There, in other words, in Sheol or the underworld, the wicked cease from troubling. There the weary are at rest. So the underworld, a place of rest, but not a place of new life and glory. There the prisoners are at ease together. They do not hear the voice of the taskmaster. The small and the great are there, and the slaves are free from their masters. So here we have Job, then his first lament. We find something similar in Psalm 88. Now Psalm 88, you could say, is perhaps the most depressing psalm in the Psalter. This is where the psalmist is in the, the, uh, the depths of the doldrums. The Psalm 88, my soul is full of troubles. My life draws near to Sheol, the underworld. I'm counted among those who go down to the pit, another word description for the grave or the underworld. I'm like those who have no help. And then questioning, do you, O oh God, work wonders for the dead? Do the shades rise up to praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in Abaddon, the land of perdition? Are your wonders known in the darkness or your saving help in the land of forgetfulness? And these rhetorical questions presume the answer, no. The psalmist is facing terrible suffering and doesn't look forward with any hope of the resurrection or of new life. So we want to move ahead now, if you don't mind, to our next text. This is from one of the wisdom books, Ecclesiastes or Koheleth. So most scholars date the book from around the third century BC. Um, and this is the uh, book that emphasizes human mortality. And there's a catchphrase, which in English Bibles is translated, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Havel havelim hakol hevel. So this is used, used as the Hebrew word hevel. Now hevel um, in most Bibles is translated vanity, um, but sometimes um, in English we think this word vanity, you think of somebody looking at themselves in the mirror and uh, you know, etc., or combing their hair and all the rest of it. But that's not what vanity means in this context. Uh, vanity in its original sense of emptiness. Um, in the Hebrew word is actually hevel, and hevel means a puff of smoke or a you know, breath of air or something like that. So in other words, human life is just like a puff of smoke. The, uh, uh, Hevel, uh, the author is teaching, Kohalath is teaching. So, um, uh, Haval Havalim Hekol Hevel. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher, all is vanity. So that's at the beginning of the book and likewise at the end of the book in chapter 12. So chapter 12 has this long allegory of old age. It begins 12 verse 1, remember your creator in the days of your youth before the days of trouble come. And then there's a, the allegory of all the physical sufferings, you know, loss of sight, a loss of hearing, a loss of strength and so on. And then ultimately it goes on. And then when the person dies, the pitcher is broken or the jug is broken and the dust returns to the earth as it was and the breath returns to God who gave it. So again, um, the, the body is buried the breath goes back to God who gave it. And then Haval Havalim, Hakol Haval. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher. All this vanity, our human life is just like a puff of smoke. In chapter three, there's a time to be born and a time to die. So here we have then the skepticism about any afterlife. Skepticism about any afterlife. So in chapter three, the author says, the fate of human beings or the fate of animals is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. So I've got a nice pet dog, Rover. And then when Rover gets to about 20 years old, uh, you know, his life wears out and poor old Rover dies. And who knows, if I was very devoted, I might even bury Rover in the ground in my back garden or something like that. 
okay, then after a certain number of years of my life, whether it be uh, 50 or 80 or 100 years or whatever length of life God gives me, that's it. I breathe my last breath and I die. So the author here is saying the fate of human beings and the fate of animals is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath. So human beings have no advantage over the animals. For all is vanity, or in Hebrew, hevel. Everything is just a puff of smoke. Life is transient and fleeting and passing. All go to one place, all come from the dust, and all return to dust again. And that may be an echo of what we have in Genesis chapter 3, where God says to Adam, dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And then this question, who knows whether the human spirit goes upward, goes to God, and the spirit of animals goes downward to the earth? So there's a question there. So maybe by this stage, one or two people might have been thinking about afterlife and resurrection. But for Kohalath, he just asks this a question. Who knows whether that's true or not? So again, there's no strong affirmation of the afterlife there. And then in chapter nine, as we move on, we can see also uh, other uh, verses that express doubt about the afterlife. Whoever is joined with all the living has hope. A living dog is better than a dead lion. The living at least know that they're going to die. But the dead know nothing. They have no more reward, and even the memory of them is lost. So again, no clear understanding of the afterlife. So in verse 10 of chapter 9, uh, the author says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. So um, while you're on earth, you've got power to do things, we'll get on and do them. There's no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol, the underworld, to which you'll go. So if you want to do something on earth, we'll do it now, because when you die, you're no longer able to do that. So that's Kohaleth, or Ecclesiastes. And we're now going to move on to another book, Ecclesiasticus, who am I going to call by uh, the Greek name Sirach. So this was a Jerusalem scribe who lived around the year 200 BC or 180 BC. Many people date his book. And I've got a picture there of a Jewish scribe copying out the scroll of the Torah. So what does um, Sirach say? So in chapter 17, he says, the Lord created human beings out of earth and then he makes them return to earth again. So the beginning of life and the end of life. And again, a reference back to uh, the story in Genesis of Adam, dust you are and to dust you shall return. Moreover then, God gave human beings a fixed number of days. So we have a fixed number of days on earth, whether our life be long or short. And in chapter 41, Sirach says, do not fear death's decree for you, okay? So don't be afraid of death, it's going to come to everybody. Remember those who went before you and those who will come after you. This is the Lord's decree for all flesh. And maybe that's a reference back to Genesis 3.19, dust you are and to dust you shall return. Why then should you reject the will of the Most High? If this is what God has said, this is what's going to happen. Don't struggle against it, accept what God uh, has decreed. And we find something similar in Sirach chapter 14. Sirach chapter 14. So it begins with the image of a garment. So just as clothes wear out and become old, so um, Sirach 14, 17 says, all living beings become old like a garment. For the decree from of old is, you must die. So all human beings are mortal. We live our life on earth and then ultimately we die. And then Sirach refers to this image that we already saw in the book of Job, the image of the tree. Like abundant leaves on a spreading tree that sheds some and puts forth others, so are the generations of flesh and blood. One dies, another is born. So there are seasons in the life of a tree. And um, you may be able to see there's a picture of an autumn scene there um, with the trees, uh, the leaves on the trees going golden, and eventually some of the leaves have fallen to the ground. And of course, for us um, uh, in our liturgical calendar, November is often the month when we remember the dead. We have All Souls Day on the 2nd of uh, uh, November. And this is a time when the leaves fall or have fallen from the trees. And that's a reminder of our mortality. So already Sirach, and also we have that in Homer's Iliad as well, this image of um, uh, leaves falling from the tree and new in the 
new year, uh, new leaves sprouting, an image for you know, the cycle of human life. So uh, one person dies and then a new generation comes along. So this image then uh, that we have uh, of, you know, based on nature from the trees. We move on now to um, the dead cannot praise God. So Sirach followed what we have in some of the earlier traditions of the Old Testament. Uh, said, uh, and it was an encouragement to people on earth to praise God. So once you're in the cemetery, you're dead and buried. Uh, you can't come to church you, in the Jewish age. You couldn't come to the temple or the synagogue to sing your psalms and offer praise to God. And we find that already in Psalm 115. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any that go down into the silence. So once you're dead and gone, you can't sing psalms and sing praise to God. But we, the living, will bless the Lord from this time onward and forevermore. And Sirach chapter 17, uh, echoing this text from the Psalms, who will be able to sing praises to the Most High in Hades, in the world of the dead, instead of the living who give thanks? So it's the role of the living people to give thanks. From the dead, as from somebody who doesn't exist, thanksgiving has ceased. Uh, we're no longer too able to utter praise of God once we're dead and gone. Those who are alive and well sing the Lord's praises. So again, um, Sirach being somewhat conservative following the earlier tradition that there was no clear uh, uh, afterlife to look forward to. So our next slide, no afterlife in the original Sirach. So again, we can see other passages and um, you may see from this that the book of Sirach has been my main area of specialization. No afterlife in the original Sirach. So chapter 10, when a person is dead, one just inherits maggots and vermin and worms. Ooh. Anyway, so um, your, your body lies uh, in the graveyard uh, to be the food of worms, doesn't bear thinking about. And chapter 38 and then talks about, um, it begins by talking about, you know, go and see the doctor when you're sick. And, and then talks about you know, pray for healing, but also pray that the, the doctor may diagnose wisely. And then what happens when somebody is sick and then when somebody dies? And then ultimately when somebody has died, when you've lost a relative or a friend, uh, chapter 38 says, don't give your heart to grief, or in other words, to excessive grief, drive it away, but instead remember your own end. So be a bit philosophical about it. You know, death will come to everybody. Don't forget there's no coming back you do the dead no good by grieving excessively. And in fact, you're also injuring yourself. So uh, and Sirach, in, or Sirach encouraging a philosophical approach. But again, he doesn't say, look forward to the hope of the resurrection. Your granny has gone to heaven and you'll look forward to seeing her in the resurrection. No, he doesn't have any clear hope of the afterlife. So what was his hope? So for Ben Sirach, survival would come in two ways through a good reputation, in other words, being remembered well after your death. So we remember what granny said and how she taught us and all the love she gave us and so on. And then also virtuous descendants. So um, granny would live on in her children, her grandchildren, her great grandchildren, and that they would do her proud by uh, living a good life. And so we find this in Sirach 44 verse 14 about the importance of a good name or a good reputation. So for those who have died, their name liveth forevermore. So their name lives on in the future. That's from the King James Version or the authorized version. And you'll see there in the next slide a picture. Their name liveth forevermore. So after the First World War with the terrible loss of life in France and, uh, and Belgium and many other uh, countries of Europe, um, there were these huge uh, war graves, uh, cemeteries, um, across the various parts of Belgium and France and other places. And um, one of the, in the memorial, there, there was a kind of huge memorial stone placed in some of these cemeteries. And on it were these simple words, their name lives forevermore. So again, a quotation from the book of Sirach, Sirach 44, their name liveth forevermore. In other words, that um, they would live on uh, because they will be remembered. You know, the, the, uh, you know the, the morning and the evening, we will remember them and so on, this kind of understanding to being remembered well. So um, Sirach regards a lasting posthumous reputation, being remembered after you're dead, that's the way to overcome death, being remembered well. We find something similar in the first book of Maccabees, chapter six, 
which praises a brave Jewish fighter or soldier by the name of Eleazar. 1 Maccabees chapter 6 says, he gave his life to save his people and so to win for himself an everlasting name. So he will be remembered in the future. People would talk about him and remember him. Others might be forgotten, but he will be remembered. We find something similar in the Greek uh, philosopher Plato in his symposium. So such thinking has parallels uh, in Greek texts. Plato refers to persons who willingly suffered any hardship, even to the point of death. Why? Because they expected to win a deathless memory for valor and bravery. So their bravery will be talked about after their death. And so in that way, they would seem to overcome or transcend death. So um, in the Syrac, you could survive death in a way by being remembered, but you could also survive through having descendants. So that's the second way somebody could overcome death, you know, through having children and grandchildren who will be able to continue the family name and continue the good work that you've begun. So Sirach 40, the family name continues in a person's descendants. Children, or perhaps sometimes the building of a city can establish one's name. So, um, you know, there are cities that are named after people, you know, Alexandria in Egypt, named after Alexander the Great and so on. But also then uh, Israelite heroes of faith, in the praise of the ancestors, chapter 44, Israelite heroes of faith survive through their faithful descendants or offspring or progeny. Their descendants stand by the covenants, their children also for their sake. Their offspring will continue forever and their glory will never be blotted out. So you have children, you have grandchildren, you have great grandchildren, and so the generations go on. And these people continue the good work and the faith that you have begun. One more text from Sirach, and then we'll move on. Sirach chapter 7. And I put there Sirach 717, Hebrew and Greek, because um, the Hebrew text of Sirach was written perhaps around 180 BC. And then at the end of the first century, um, the book was translated probably by the author's grandson into Greek. We see that once you come to the, the grandson's translation, this is after the time of the Maccabees. And so the translator sometimes puts in um, hints of the afterlife. And we see this in chapter 7, verse 17. So what do we have in the Hebrew text? So the Hebrew text says this, um, humble yourself to the utmost because the expectation of mortals is worms. So in other words, the author is saying to human beings, don't be so high and mighty. You live your life on earth, okay? Maybe you can do lots of things and you have power. To the end, you'll die and you'll be buried and become the food of worms. Humble yourself to the utmost the expectation of mortals is worms. But when we come to the Greek text, uh, translated, as I say, maybe by the author's grandson, maybe in Egypt, in Alexandria, at the end of the second century, there is an understanding of uh, post-mortem existence and even post-mortem judgment. And the mention of worms is now applied to you know, the bad guys, to the wicked. So it seems to refer to judgment after death. So humble yourself to the utmost, don't be guilty of pride, because if you are guilty of pride and wickedness and arrogance and sin, the punishment of the ungodly is fire and worms. So as well as worms, there's a mention of fire. So some kind of understanding of uh, some kind of punishment after death. So already you can see that within a hundred years um, in the text, uh, if you compare the Hebrew and the Greek, you can see that after the time of the Maccabees, there was some kind of understanding of you know, post-mortem existence. Um, and as we'll see, the positive resurrection for the good guys, but for the wicked, uh, there will be punishment. So good, moving on swiftly to the book of Ezekiel. So Ezekiel the prophet. So we're now going back in time a little to uh, the sixth century uh, BC, the time of the exile in Babylon. So here we have a picture of the prophet Ezekiel uh, looking out over the valley of the dry bones. That great prophecy when Ezekiel is told to call on these dry bones uh, to take flesh and that breath would enter into them and that they would revive. So this is Ezekiel's idea of God recreating the nation at the time of the exile. So in its original context, this passage from Ezekiel 37 employs the image of dry bones to promise earthly revival of the nation that was, has been exiled in Babylon. So this prophecy doesn't refer to actual post-mortem resurrection of individuals. 
even though for us in the light of our Christian faith and the light of the resurrection of Christ and our hope of the resurrection, we could understand it now as hinting at that. But in its original context, as we'll see in the chapter itself, it's talking about the revival of the nation, a collective revival. So reviving the dead bones. So seeing these dead bones, is, the prophet Ezekiel is told, prophesy, speak to these bones, say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I'm going to cause ruach, breath or spirit to enter into you and then you will live. So just as the original Adam came to life when God breathed into the dust and he became a living soul, so now God will recreate his people. So you'll see there a picture of some dead bones in a kind of flat land, some kind of valley. And um, when once the Babylonians conquered the Holy Land and they took the people off into exile, there would have been many uh, Jews who would have been uh, killed and put to death, who would have died in battles and other situations. So you could see this idea of this image of the Valley of Dry Bones. But now um, Ezekiel is called to speak to the dry bones and uh, that they would revive and that um, the uh, spirit would come into them. But this is a, a prophecy that's speaking uh, symbolically about the revival of the people of Israel, revival of the nation. And the prophet receives an interpretation for the vision. Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They've been saying our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, we're just cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves O my people and I'll bring you back to the land of Israel. I'll put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you back on your own soil. So in other words, Ezekiel is saying that the Jewish exiles would return home from Babylon, return to the land of Israel. Now, if there had actually been literally people reviving, physical resurrections, we would have known about it. But that didn't happen. No, this was symbolically, collectively. It's so not the case that those who had already died came back to life, but that the people, the nation as a whole, that collectively seemed to be dead, was now going to be revived, and God was going to restore them to their land, as indeed happened when King Cyrus the Great, the Persian king, took over Babylon and allowed the Jews to return home to their original land, the land of Israel. Time is racing on, let's move ahead. Development of hope in the afterlife, theological response to the Maccabean crisis. So we're moving ahead now to the second century BC. And that there's a slide there with uh, the coin of a king, a Greek king by the name of Antiochus. So what we have inscribed on the coin, King Antiochus, God manifest, bearer of victory. So King Antiochus was a pagan king, Greek-speaking king, who ruled from Syria, but ruled over the Holy Land, the land of Israel, the land of Palestine. And um, he claimed to be God manifest. He claimed to be a manifestation of Zeus, of the great god Zeus. And so because of that, he didn't want any other religions or any other worship uh, in his territories. So he banned the practice of Judaism. So he became persecutor of the Jews. So he reigned from the years 175 to 164 BC. But in the last three years of his life, 167 to 164, um, he became a great persecutor of the Jews and he killed a lot of the devout Jews. He martyred them, as we will see. But, um, his persecution was resisted by a group of people called the Maccabees. There were some, the Hasidim, who resisted peacefully and there were others that resisted uh, through violence, uh, uh, the Maccabees. So it's just an artist's impression of the um, uh, desolation, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and the killing of many of the devout Jews there, just an artist's impression. We move ahead to our next slide, the persecution of devout Jews by Antiochus Epiphanes. The persecution of devout Jews by Antiochus Epiphanes. So we read about this in the first book of Maccabees and the second book of Maccabees. The first book of Maccabees tends to emphasize you know, the secular historical aspects of it, whereas the second book of Maccabees emphasizes much more the theological aspects of the, of the events. So what does the first Maccabees, first Maccabees chapter one tell us? Anyone found, uh, found possessing the book of the covenant, anyone who adhered to the law or the Torah was condemned to death by decree of the king Antiochus Epiphanes. So a great persecution of the devout Jews. So what did uh, the Greeks do? They put to death the women who had their children circumcised 
one of the basic rules of Jewish faith, and their families and those who circumcised them. And then here's something really terrible. They hung the infants from the necks of their mothers. However, many in Israel stood firm and resolved in their hearts not to eat the unclean food um, because the king was trying to get the Jews to eat pork, which was forbidden in the Jewish Torah. They chose to die rather than to be defiled or contaminated by food or to profane the Holy Covenant. And indeed, they did die. So in the context of this great persecution by uh, this pagan king Antiochus Epiphanes, um, people are, were asking questions. Um, is this just? Is this fair? So the slide, why resurrection hope arose. So a German scholar Otto Kaiser explains the reasoning by which the persecuted Jews began to envisage or think about a resurrection. So was God no longer keeping the promises of blessing that he made to the obedient? So God demanded unconditional loyalty and unconditional obedience from Israel. He tolerated no other God beside himself. That was the great commandment. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall have no other God besides me or before me. So what about people who followed that? Uh, surely there were blessings promised to people who kept the law, Deuteronomy chapter 30. But how come the opposite seems to be happening? So thus devout Jews were led to accept that God's righteousness and justice is exercised within a horizon that goes beyond the limits of a single human life. So God could recreate the people in the resurrection. So the Maccabean era, what we could call innovation or development, namely God recreating the martyrs. So another scholar, George Nicholsberg, he identifies the theological problem of these martyrdoms. When the faithful Jews had died as martyrs because of their obedience to the Torah, the commands of God, but the unfaithful Jews survived. Thus piety, following the ways of God, caused death, but disobedience to the ways of God led to life. Clearly, this went against the standard Israelites' canons or principles of justice and retribution. So now what was an answer to this problem? Resurrection to life for the good guys, resurrection to punishment for the bad guys was an answer to this problem. So the next slide, what about the righteous then who died for, the faith, for their sake in God? So were good people who went to their deaths because they wouldn't disobey the commands of God. So the question arises, and if God is just and fair, surely he would reward the just and the sorry, the just and the devout sufferer. If God is creator, surely he could restore the martyrs to a new life, while at the same time punishing the cruel tyrants. Thus, what seemed to be a lack of justice, evident when the faithful Jews were martyrs, finds its redress, balance is restored in the notion of a final judgment. And in the final judgment, the good will ultimately receive their reward and evildoers will receive their punishment. And even Plato has something a little bit similar um, because he states that following a post-mortem judgment, the virtuous or the righteous will go to the isles of the blessed while the wicked will depart to Tartarus, a kind of uh, place like hell. So we see in the book of Daniel, um, this a reference to the resurrection. So resurrection in Daniel chapter 12. So the oldest biblical text uh, that seems to clearly speak of the resurrection is Daniel chapter 12, which is usually dated from around this time of the Maccabees, around 165. So after the terrible persecution, what's going to happen? God's going to intervene. At that time, Archangel Michael shall arise, and after a time of anguish, your people shall be delivered, everyone found written in the book. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. So there's going to be resurrection, but some will rise to everlasting life. But on the other hand, the bad guys, some shall rise to shame and everlasting contempt. So it's depicted on this uh, slide, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So this is actually a promise of the resurrection. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And then verse three takes it further with this imagery of shining brightly. Those who are wise, or perhaps those who teach wisdom, more like the masculine, shall shine like the brightness of the sky. And those who lead many to righteousness shall shine like the stars forever and ever. So there's going to be bright glory for those who died with faith, 
and those who kept to the ways of God. The devout Jews are promised an eternal reward, the punishment awaits the persecutors. We find in Matthew 13, similar language, the righteous will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom. Now, was the book of Daniel the only book that um, had this hope of a resurrection? Well, just before the book of uh, Daniel was uh, completed, there was a text, the so-called Epistle of Enoch. Now, there were five books of Enoch, um, which never made their way into the biblical canon, although in the Ethiopian church, they're read as a kind of scriptural text. But there many passages were found at Qumran among the Dead Sea Scrolls. So this was around the time of uh, a similar kind of time. So um, what does it say in 1st Enoch chapter 103? The souls of the pious who've died will come to life, and they will rejoice and be glad. Their spirits will not perish, nor will their memory perish from the presence of the Great One for all the generations of eternity. So some kind of idea of afterlife. The righteous as they shine will see those who are born in darkness, the bad guys, being cast into darkness. So the wicked will be cast into darkness. The sinners will cry out and they will see the righteous shining, but they for their part will depart to where the days and the times are written for them. So they'll go to their eternal punishment that's destined for them. So again, this is not in the Bible, um, but this was also another text from around the time of Daniel. So this idea of resurrection or afterlife um, was in the air and became strong uh, uh, because of the experience of the Jews who suffered uh, martyrdom uh, at the time of the Maccabees. So here we have a picture of the mother with her seven sons, several of the sons um, lying there, uh, they've just been killed. You can see the king pointing accusingly at the mother and just perhaps the youngest son is probably just left there in the picture. So moving on to the text, the martyrdom of the mother and her seven sons, 2 Maccabees chapter seven. So perhaps the clearest expression of faith in the resurrection in the Old Testament occurs in the story of the martyrdom of the mother and her seven sons in the second book of Maccabees, chapter seven. And just a, a brief word to say that um, in many Protestant Bibles, the book of Maccabees, like the book of Sirach, is not included. So um, in, for many Protestants, these would be regarded as apocryphal books. Um, but in the Catholic tradition, um, we include these the, um, among the seven deuterocanonical books, uh, First Maccabees, Second Maccabees, Sirach, the Book of Wisdom that we'll talk about in a moment, Baruch, Tobit, and Judith. So these were late books, late comers, uh, so we call them deuterocanonical, they're like the second canon, they're late comers to the canon, we still read them and treat them as canonical. Okay, a clear expression of faith in the resurrection occurs in the story of the martyrdom of the mother and her seven sons, in 2 Maccabees 7. This chapter focuses on the mother with her seven male children who are all martyred for their Jewish faith while holding on to the hope of being recreated in the resurrection. So this is a kind of personal counterpart to the national revival in Ezekiel 37. So the second son says to King Antiochus Epiphanes, you are cursed wretch, you are dismissing us from this present life, but the king of the universe will raise us up to an everlasting renewal of life because we've died for his laws. The fifth son asserts, one cannot but choose to die at the hands of mortals while cherishing the hope that God gives of being raised up again by him. But for you, there'll be no resurrection to life. And notice this word anastasis, which we also have in the New Testament. Afterlife hope, the third brother. The third brother stretches out his hands to his persecutors. Take these hands. I received these from heaven. And because of his laws, I now disdain them. But from him, I hope to get them back again. So when my body is recreated in the resurrection, I look forward to receiving new hands, even if you cut my hands off. And finally, the youngest son affirms, our brothers, my other six brothers who've now died as martyrs, our brothers after enduring a brief suffering have drunk of ever flowing life under God's covenant. But you, uh, by the judgment of God, will receive just punishment for your arrogance. So King Antiochus Epiphanes, the persecutor, and those with him will be punished. And then we have creation renewed. And very interestingly, um, the mother of the seven sons, and she's the last to die. So before uh, all the sons have died, the mother says to her sons, it wasn't I who gave you life and breath, nor I who set in order the elements within each one of you. 
Therefore, the creator of the world, who shaped the beginning of humankind and devised the origin of all things, will in his mercy give life and breath to you again, since you now forget yourself for the sake of his laws. So if God is creator, God could be recreator. God could renew his creation in the resurrection. And then here, the next slide is a stained glass window. God will raise us up to eternal life. So on the right hand side, you see sitting on his throne, uh, the king, King Antiochus Epiphanes. On the left hand side, you see the mother surrounded by all her seven children. They've been bound and chained in preparation uh, for being uh, uh, put to death. So you've got the mother and the seven sons all defying the king because of their faith in the resurrection. And then the mother's words to her youngest son. So again, talk about the gestation of a uh, child in the womb and how God could recreate. So she says to her youngest son, I carried you for nine months in my womb. I nursed you for three years. I reared you and brought you up to this point in your life and I've taken care of you. I beg you, my child, to look at heaven and earth and see everything in them. Recognize that God didn't make them out of existing things. So God is the creator. God could create from nothing. In the same way the human race came into being because God created them. So accept death so that in God's mercy, I may get you back again along with your brothers, that God would recreate you in the resurrection. So a commentator, a Jewish commentator on 2nd Maccabees, Jonathan Goldstein in the Anchor Bible series uh, has an interesting explanation. He says, resurrection only seems to be impossible. Human beings, if they hadn't already seen the existence of the universe, and if they weren't aware of human reproduction, would declare them to be impossible for they can explain or fathom or under fully understand neither. Yet the universe came into being after previously not existing. Even today, people talk about the Big Bang. And so does every member of the human race. A new child is born, seemingly out of nothing. A dead human being has indeed ceased to exist, but he or she existed previously. Surely it's more conceivable, easier to understand that existence can be restored to someone or something that previously existed, then that existence should be conferred on something that didn't exist. So if God can create things that never existed before, surely he can recreate what's already existed. And where the time is marching on, but just our last passage that we're going to be looking at is from the book of wisdom. The souls of the righteous are in the hands of God. No torment shall touch them because they are in peace. And then there's a, an inscription, a grave inscription uh, uh, from a cemetery in Rome uh, from the Christian era. But it's an exhortation to bravely overcome the end of earthly life because death is a common lot of all human beings. Take courage, Asklas. No one is immortal. Budes Athanatos. Athanatos. Nobody is immortal. But in the Book of Wisdom, we do have this hope of immortality. So afterlife hope in the Septuagint Book of Wisdom. So as the latest deuterocanonical book, or some would call it the apocryphal book before the New Testament, we're now going to consider the book of wisdom. This work was probably the latest book of the Septuagint or the Greek Bible to be written close to the time of Jesus, uh, probably written in Alexandria, a great center of Greek culture. So it says in chapter three, verse one, the souls of the, vir the virtuous or the righteous are in the hands of God, no torment will ever touch them. Many of you have probably heard this reading being read at funerals. And then what's the promise for the righteous? The hope is full of athanasia, immortality. The same name, Athanasius. Again, this idea of immortality. Recompense in the afterlife. So like the second book of Maccabees, the book of wisdom solves the problem of theodicy, the justice of God in the face of suffering, and particularly the justice of God in the face of somebody who dies for their faith, a martyr. So like the second book of Maccabees, the Book of Wisdom solves this puzzle by teaching that the earthly suffering of the devout, especially devout martyrs, are recompensed by a glorious afterlife. So the immediately preceding passage in Wisdom chapter 2 describes this suffering inflicted on an innocent just person who is condemned to a shameful death. And this is a reading that we read um, uh, just before Easter, you know, around Holy Week, about the, and we refer it to the Passion of Christ very often in our liturgy. But anyway, after that, then the martyr or the devout one who's died is now rewarded for having suffered on earth. So in the next slide, we have a picture of 
uh, a crucible uh, and the furnace and metal being purified. So we have this image in Wisdom 3 verse 6 about the testing of the devout, especially devout martyrs. Like gold in the furnace, he tried them. Like a sacrificial burnt offering, he accepted them. Our next slide, rewarding the faithful, Wisdom 3 verses 5 and 6. So while acknowledging that earthly life can be unjust and cruel, and indeed some even are martyred, the Book of Wisdom um, expresses faith that the God of justice will reward the righteous in the next life. So even though um, the righteous have been disciplined a little, they will receive great good. Why? Because God has tested them. God has found them worthy of himself. And even if they died as martyrs, it's like a purification and an offering, like gold in the furnace, God tried them, like a sacrificial burnt offering, he accepted them. And then divine visitation. So think the tables are going to be turned. Those who are downtrodden are now going to be in charge. Divine visitation will make rulers out of the previous martyrs. So in the time of their visitation, they will shine forth. Again, this image of brightness that we had in Daniel as well. At the time of their visitation, they will shine forth. They will run like sparks through the stubble. But the ungodly will be punished as their reasoning deserves. Those who disregarded the righteous and rebelled against the law. And here the author of wisdom seems to echo the prophet Malachi. See the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and the evildoers will be stubble. They can be burnt up. The day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. But on the other hand, for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. So what we have at the end of the book of Malachi is now applied to the resurrection for the book of wisdom. The wicked are going to be burnt up like stubble, but the righteous, the virtuous, will shine out, as in Daniel. So judgment was given for the holy. So although Wisdom chapter 2 describes how the faithful Jews, some of them were even condemned to death by the Gentiles, they died because of their faith in God, uh, and they were mocked. You know, this fellow calls himself a child of, of uh, God. Let's test him and let's even put him to death. Um, now the tables are going to be turned in the afterlife at the time of God's visitation. So the author envisages the martyred Jews exercising authority over Gentile nations. They're going to rise to power in the future. They will govern nations, they will rule over peoples, and the Lord will reign over them forever. And the author may be recalling Daniel's vision of the arrival of the Ancient of Days. Judgment was given for or to the saints, the holy ones of the Most High. The time arrived when the holy ones or the saints gained possession of the kingdom. And indeed, in the book of Revelation, you find something similar that thrones are prepared you know, for the uh, 12 apostles and for others, you know, that they would have the power of judgment. So just to conclude the last couple of slides, no clear hope of a personal afterlife in Israel before the Maccabees. So this survey has traced the general development of Jewish belief post-mortem, after death, during the ages before the New Testament. We saw something of Israel's faith journey through several centuries, a whistle-stop tour. The traditional belief found in much of the Old Testament was that the dead had some kind of shadow existence in Sheol or the underworld, Job, Psalms. Some wisdom books like Job and Ecclesiastes and Sirach have no clear belief in any meaningful personal afterlife. Now, prophets like Ezekiel spoke of a collective revival of the suffering nation using the language of resurrection or recreation. Possibly this might be true in Isaiah 25, 26 as well, and Hosea chapter 6. Last slide, development of hope in the afterlife, a theological response to the Maccabean crisis. It seems that the persecution of the devout Jews by King Antiochus Epiphanes, the great persecutor, led to the growing belief in individual resurrection, and especially for martyrs. Such a resurrection belief is evident in Daniel chapter 12, 2 Maccabees chapter 7, and also Wisdom chapter 3, before it became predominant in the New Testament. A Christian rereading of Job chapter 19, I know that my Redeemer lives, may find a fuller sense, including the resurrection, in Job's declaration that the, that the Redeemer lives. However, belief in the afterlife is hardly present in the original meaning of the text, so we see a kind of development there, and even Cardinal John Henry Newman, now St. John Henry Newman, spoke about the development of doctrine. So God was teaching the people of Israel throughout their history. And um, a couple of centuries before the time of Christ, the expectation of the resurrection came about. 
And of course, for us as Christians, this is seen particularly in the resurrection of Christ our Saviour, which we celebrate every Easter day. Thank you very much for listening. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and welcome back. Thank you once again, Jeremy, for your wonderful presentation uh, before our break. Um, and there's been some questions coming in, but I thought uh, as we got Adrian here as well, um, we were just having a little chat during the break. Adrian might, might kick us off with, with some questions or some thoughts that he was having as well on the basis of your, of your talk. Yeah, I thank you very much, Jeremy. It was, it was very rich and, and, and uh, reminded me of so much that uh, I began to forget. Um, and the slides are fantastic. So thank you for all of that. What I was wondering about, it suddenly came to me uh, that Moses and Elijah, I believe that their presence at the Transfiguration is not about the law and the prophets. It's about afterlife, especially in Luke when they talking about the exodus of Jesus. And then I suddenly remembered the text in, in Genesis of Enoch, that Enoch walked with God and then God took him. So Perhaps you could say a little bit about intimations of afterlife for specific individuals in the narrative traditions earlier in the Bible. Okay, yes. So thank you. Yes, that's a very um, uh, important question. And um, okay, so, um, so when we read Genesis chapter five, it talks about God taking Enoch. Um, and th there's not really any explanation there, but certainly um, in the later interpretation, uh, there was the idea that he was taken up to heaven. And that's one of the reasons why, um, um, although it's not in the Bible, there were the books of Enoch, which claim to be revelations of what Enoch saw when he went to heaven. These were heavenly revelations. That's why Enoch was picked. A bit later on, then you've also then got the story of Elijah, Second Maccabees, sorry, Second Kings, chapter two. Um, uh, uh, Elijah crosses the Jordan, and he's taken up in some kind of whirlwind or tornado into the sky. So the understanding then that uh, he, he was uh, taken up to be with God in heaven, uh, in the heavenly chariot. Then also though with Moses, um, uh, at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, it, it, it talks about, uh, just as um, Moses was buried um, in, the la in, in the land of Moab, but no one knows where he was buried. And there were some traditions later on that somehow uh, God took him or he ascended or something like that, although uh, uh, that's not stated specifically um, in the in the Hebrew text of the Bible. Um, so there were these traditions that there were one or two people uh, uh, that were taken up by God uh, to heaven, if you like. So even in the book of Sirach, which it doesn't have any uh, mm. great hope in the afterlife, it certainly mentions about Enoch and it mentions about Elijah being uh, taken up. So these would have been, um, you know, unique uh, or special uh, uh, instances really. So in a sense, you could say this kind of does hint or point a little bit towards um, uh, some kind of uh, thought about the afterlife, at least for just a very selected few of few people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, and another question that came through uh, from, our, from our viewers, um, it's quite a big question, but I think we might focus it maybe on some of the, the earlier books, maybe the pre-Maccabee uh, era books. Uh, so I'll read the question, then we can think about uh, focusing it. It says, according to these books, so I think particularly the pre-Maccabean uh, wisdom books, uh, what is life and what are the functions that makes a person alive or dead? So I wondered in particular in relation to that idea, you were talking about um, someone being alive and then this kind of more shadowy existence in Sheol. I just wondered about that sense of what is it to be alive if you've then got this kind of shadowy existence in Sheol? I just wondered if you could say something a little bit more about that. The mean <laughs> rather than answering the whole question what is the meaning of life but but this is the understanding of life i think in some of those texts i'll say well then maybe adrian might like to add something um, yeah the main the main um point that i'd like to make is that um whereas um, in the in the greek world there was the idea of you had the physical body and then you also had the, the soul and the soul was something separate that came to rest in the body um in the jewish tradition um there was great emphasis on the unity of you know body and soul so you know, the body was absolutely essential uh, for life. So, um, so even though um, after death, there was some kind of idea of some kind of shadowy existence in the underworld in Shell, um, that wasn't real life. The only real life was life you know, in the physical body. And that's why in our Christian faith, you know, we, we, the creed ends, you know, we believe in the resurrection of the body, in the physical resurrection. Uh, it's not some kind of ethereal you know, 
spirit or something like that, or you know, a soul floating around in the ether. Um, you know, that physical reality was essential. And so, especially in the Old Testament, um, uh, you know, the, the physical uh, presence of a person, you know, that was essential for life. I think, Adrian, would you like to say? Uh, yeah, I, I would be a little bit encouraged by Sheol, though, because, <laughs> it, again, it's saying that there's got to be something that the idea mm. that God, as you were talking about creation out of nothing and creation of, but if God has created people, well, surely it, it's sort of abhorrent to human beings. And I think that's a good instinct that there should be nothing. So maybe all we're going to get is shale, but <laughs> maybe that's a, 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 a nuance that I would like to at least consider. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so anyway, so so it was a very kind of shadowy existence. And suddenly yeah. when the Maccabi says the kind of the idea of the clear, glorious resurrection exactly. of the life, yeah. Yeah. the fullness yeah. of life. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both. And, and that sense of the bodily nature of what it is to be alive, I think, is important that, you, that you're picking out there. And uh, another of our, of our viewers uh, spoke particularly about the two Maccabees 7 uh, text, um, but the kind of theological kind of basis, the theological um, foundations of that that you spoke about, um, Jeremy, about the nature of God, the being of God as being just and mercy and as creator, that in a sense of what also emerges in these texts is that theological reflection on, on, on God. So again, I don't know if you want to say a little bit more about that, but, but what comes out in these texts is where is resurrection grounded, um, if it is kind of grounded on the on being of God. Really. So I don't know if you want to, to tell exactly. about that That's theological the side. Hmm. Yes, yeah, so there, there is a, a clear kind of theology there um, based on the theology of God as creator. Now, um, I was referring earlier to the book of Ezekiel where you've got the idea of the, the, the dry bones coming back to life and so on. But that was a kind of a collective uh, uh, thought uh, that the nation as a whole would, would, would revive. But then um, presumably people were reflecting that if God could collectively revive the nation, surely he could revive individuals who had died and especially individuals who had died uh, you know, for the sake of God, if God was the creator, and as Jonathan Goldstein says, you know, uh, if God can create people in the first place, surely He can recreate them. Uh, so you know, and so these echoes that we have of Genesis, you know, the creation story, uh, you know, that that's an important uh, theological element here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Because yeah, I think that came across really strongly. This reflection on. The, you know, it can't be the end, it can't be appropriate that, as you said, the, the martyrs, they've been faithful to God, they've you know, suffered at the hands of this kind of persecutor, and that can't be fair, this isn't what God is like, God is just, mm -hmm. God is merciful, God is the creator, I think that's, that's that kind of, mm -hmm. uh, aspect Maybe that comes out really nicely. Yeah. Maybe we could also mention Isaiah 53, um, that sort of, you know, the, the fourth servant song and the way it's read on Good Friday, and then he will see the light, if that's a, I mean, I, th I think the text is very difficult, but it's almost, there has to be some kind of suggestion at the end of those, of those songs that there is, there is a hope. And of course, the whole question of who this servant is anyway, but if it's about suffering humanity, suffering humanity does have a future, in God's eyes, even though we, we don't understand how. And then in a very genuine way, this, this is preparing for the, the Christian revelation. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, thank you. Uh, another of our viewers was asking about um, the wisdom of Solomon and particularly in relation, you remember that image you showed, um, Jeremy, of that kind of uh, gravestone, the, the kind of um, no, one yeah. is, um, mm. no one is immortal, no one is kind of deathless. Um, and they, they're just wondering a little bit, if you could say a little bit more really about how this idea of immortality or resurrection in, in Wisdom of Solomon related to that kind of Greek world, the surrounding Greek world, did they, did they not have kind of hope in afterlife? You, you did touch a little bit on, on fate. I just wonder if you could say a little bit more in terms of what's emerging through the Jewish and then the Christian tradition, how that compared to the kind of surrounding. <laughs> That's a huge topic, but just, you know, just the aspects that you could kind of um, share with us on. Oh. Okay, well, to, just to say that um, to generalize about the Greek world is very difficult because um, it was a culture that w lasted many hundreds of years uh, with many important figures and uh, philosophers and poets and so on. So, um, but for example, there were some uh, people, for example, um, Epicurus thought, you know, 
once you're dead and gone, that's it, and you just need to yeah. accept it. Others, uh, you know, has a little bit more, it's something a bit different. Uh, so I say the one of the main differences is, was that um, in in much Greek thinking, you know, you know Plato and so on, you know, the, even if the you you the, 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 they had the idea that the soul was almost kind of trapped in the body, and that when you died, the soul kind of went free and so on. So it was very much different from the Hebrew tradition, where you know the body is very important, you know, for life. Um, but so in terms of the book of wisdom, it, so it talks about immortality, athanasia, uh, mm -hmm. wisdom three verse four. Um, the, there isn't any clear use of the language of uh, resurrection, at, at least not in chapter three. Um, but nevertheless, um, the um, uh, you know the, the two are different. You know all of this is, if you like, you know these are realities of faith, but it's also kind of symbolic language. Uh, you know. You know, we rise, you know, this is a physical image, you know, you get up and you rise. So um, the language of resurrection and the language of immortality, they're two different uh, mm. forms of language. Um, but nevertheless, uh, you know, in the Book of Wisdom, I would think that they, you know, they say something a little bit similar, but using different language, different expressions, really. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so that language of uh, Athanasi, as you were saying, that kind of uh, wisdom language, yeah, that's, that's fascinating. I, I, there's another... Um, email in uh, uh, from kind of New Testament names because again we were looking at that kind of emergence through the New Testament period and they were asking about this idea that you get in the New Testament that spoke for example about Lazarus this idea of, of a belief in resurrection on the last day you know more general resurrection idea uh, and they were asking again where does that emerge from in terms of Old Testament or Second Temple text this idea of a, a, a general resurrection a resurrection on the last day um, that you get referred to in the New Testament where um, is there kind of echoes of that in, in some of those other texts you were talking about? Well, yes, for example, well, even the Book of Wisdom, chapter three, you know, it talks about, um, uh, you know, the passage we read at funerals uh, you know, emphasizes, you know, the, uh, you know, the life of the virtuous, but there's also the, uh, this punishment for the wicked. So, um, so in Wisdom 3, verse 7, it says, at the time of their visitation, they will shine forth and run like sparks through the stubble. But then it says in 3, verse 10, the ungodly will be punished as their reasoning uh, deserves, those who disregarded the righteous and rebelled against the Lord. And then in Wisdom chapter 5, there's a, a kind of a scenario of uh, the, 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 the court, the uh, court of judgment, where the wicked come along uh, in the afterlife and they say, you know, we never knew that these were really the right, you know, the good people were really doing what was right. And so on, we, did, we, we kind of repent of their mistakes, but sort of too late. They realize that, you know, the righteous were, were doing the will of God and so on. And then also in the Enoch literature, we find a similar kind of idea of the last judgment as well, uh, although that's not in, the, in our Bible. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that. And that, that was interesting to where we brought in that Enoch material as well. I think that's fascinating for people to kind of uh, follow up on. Um, so I thought then as well, um, one text we could kind of reflect on as a way of almost kind of rounding off our our discussion would be the one where you began and end really the Job, the Job 19 uh, passage. <laughs> I was like, I can't get handled to the sire out of my head now, which is always a good thing. Uh, so thank you as well for your, for your singing. It's just a such a beautiful passage. Um, I, I, again, I just wondered um, what other aspects you brought out was this uh, looking at texts like the book of Job in their original context and the meaning it might have, and then how texts like that get picked up and reread in the Christian tradition. And you mentioned in terms of the resurrection uh, of Christ, you have that image at the end of your, your slides, and also Augustine you refer to. I just wondered if you were to reflect a little bit on that, maybe even Adrian as well, in terms of your own uh, kind of preaching and ministry, how these texts can almost be multi-layered, that you can have the original meaning in a certain context, and then how they've been read and reread in, in new ways in the Christian tradition. I don't know if that's a nice way of drawing I'll, I'll, that together. I'll say, word, I'll say a word, and then maybe Adrian might like to add mm. something. Yes, uh, Raymond Brown had the idea of the fuller sense of scripture, um, and that maybe the original authors didn't always fully understand, you know, in the way that we would understand. And that's not surprising. Um, so even just, um, you know, you might have a song or a poem that's kind of reread and so on. Um, you know, there was that song, uh, Candle in the Wind, that was sung in regard to Marilyn Monroe, but then was later reapplied to uh, the, the funeral of Princess Diana and so on. So a text can be reread in the light of later circumstances. That's just a you know a, a secular mm. example. But you know, um, you know, if we talk about the progress of revelation, God revealing Himself gradually to the uh, people of Israel, they would have understood deeper meanings. 
So presumably the original prophets didn't always understand exactly uh, yeah. uh, the, the fullness of what they were writing. And obviously for us as Christians, we would say that in the light of Christ, you know, the, the message becomes clearer. But even, you know, during the history of the church, you know, uh, texts that point to the doctrine of the Trinity, just to give you an example, you know, we now have our theology of the Trinity, you know, based on the hints and the, you know, what we, the texts that we have, but, you know, drawing the things together in a more systematic kind of way. Um, so there are many ways in which there's kind of a development of understanding. I don't know if Adrian wants to add something. Yeah, yeah. I think um, the fuller sense, if it defines and stops we said this is the meaning and that's it that's very unhelpful because i think you know scripture tells us that we're going to understand more and more the spirit will guide us towards the truth and i think that the um i'm just thinking of the pandemic you know yeah, yeah. god put the man in the garden to look up to work it and to look after it or you know you should look after your brothers and sisters the foreigner among you i mean those two texts which for me encapsulate what we need to learn from the pandemic, that we need to look after creation better than we have been doing. And we also need to care for our brothers and sisters. I mean, those are the two messages which are clearly there in the scriptures. And how can we connect the scriptures to people's uh, vision of pandemic and say, well, it is actually about very profound things which lie at the heart, not only of Christianity and Judaism, but a lot of other religious traditions as well. So, you know, fuller and fuller, it's, and, and it hasn't finished yet. You know? yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. I think that's a really wonderful way to kind of draw our discussion to a close, thinking about those fuller meanings, this ongoing living sense of scripture, isn't it? That they, there's a kind of, of the original meanings, but that doesn't exhaust it. These are prophetic mm -hmm. texts we read and read those through the Spirit, read in the light of the, the New Testament, and as I said, read in the light of our, of our own context. And that's why this idea of scriptural interpretation never ends, because we always need to read the text again in our own times and reflect on them. So, so thank you both very, very much indeed. Thank you, Jerry, for your just absolutely wonderful talk and your presentation of those texts, um, which many people have listened to today. But also, as I, as I said, we'll, we'll put the recording up on the the web page i'll mention that in just a moment and so people can listen to it again and thank you too for adrian for being here with us today and for sharing your thoughts and comments too um, so i'll just round off with one or two little uh, points so thank you very very much again jeremy uh, for such a wonderful informative and enjoyable lecture you've drawn us more deeply into the path of wisdom assisting us to reflect more deeply on the hope for life beyond death in dialogue with job and ben syra ezekiel and daniel uh, and the maccabean martyrs those of you who'd like to enjoy today's wonderful lecture again, or encourage your friends to hear it, the video recording will be uploaded very soon to the whatgoodnews.org website. So that's the, the place where you'll have got the link from today, uh, www.whatgoodnews.org. Uh, so if you go there, you'll be able to, very soon, when the recording's uploaded, you'll be able to kind of either watch it again or encourage friends uh, to go and see the link there. Uh, if you're interested in being informed of future CBA GB talks and lectures, uh, please do send us an email to the same email address that people use today for questions, catholicbiblicalassociation.gb at gmail.com. So that's catholicbiblicalassociation.gb at gmail.com. And if you contact us and give us your permission to email you, we'll then send you details of future events and talks. Uh, so this has been the kind of the, the final one, the culminating one, the fourth in our series, really. Um, for the kind of 80th anniversary of the Catholic Biblical Association. Uh, we're hoping to have some new talks again in, in the new academic year from September, October onwards. Uh, so do send us an email and we'll update you of those. And again, we'll try and advertise them uh, as they come up. Uh, if you're interested in hearing a little bit more about the history of the Catholic Biblical Association in Britain, uh, please do keep an eye out for the July edition of the Pastoral Review, uh, in which I've written a short article on that topic uh, to mark the 80th anniversary of the CBA GB. Um, so if you go to their website, The Pastoral Review, uh, that's www.thepastoralreview.org uh, for more information. Um, so it's a quarterly journal, has a subscription, so you can go there and find out uh, details on that. So that's www.thepastoralreview.org. Um, so as uh, so this July, there's uh, an article about um, the, the kind of history of the Catholic Biblical Association, just a brief one on the 80th anniversary. 
Um, and so thank you very, very much again uh, for joining us today, uh, for being present with us. Uh, thank you particularly for Jeremy for your really wonderful uh, talk and presentation on the afterlife hope in these wisdom texts. Uh, and also Adrian for your insights and conversations. So thank you all and hopefully see you all again soon.